great risers this morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, the announcements are on the back of the bulletin. I just want to draw your attention to a couple of things. Next Sunday, we will have the privilege of having Reverend Jan Hazlitt preach for us as it is Knox's um, annual meeting. As this is Lenten season, there are quite a few Lenten activities going on, so please refer to them in the bulletin and if you can join in, that would be wonderful. Also in um, the narthex on the cork board, there's a couple of sign-up sheets. One is for goodies for after church, and the other one is from session for those that uh, can help set up making the coffee and setting up the, uh, the table. So your help would be greatly appreciated. Next Sunday, I think, is going to be the beginning of our coffee after church. And if there aren't any further announcements, Reverend Depp. You remembered. <laughs> uh, please join with me in our, uh, our Lenten uh, insert for our call to worship. Just as the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness, in the wilderness, we too are confronted by our hunger and thirst. We are tempted to grab empty promises that offer an easy way out. Like Jesus, we are tempted by power and prestige. Unlike him, we often submit to their plan. We wonder whether God is with us. We wonder whether we can trust God to take care of us. We can only move forward in faith. Let us stand on the good edge and let Jesus dare to trust. Let's pray. Christ of the wilderness and of the crowded street, whispering in the desert and shouting in the market, you walk with us to challenge and encourage us, revealing our weakness and offering us hope. Help us to hear you above temptation's promises. Strengthen us to follow you on the highways of your world. With the power of the Holy Spirit, energize us to embrace the future, trusting in your grace and steadfast love throughout the times and seasons of our lives. Amen. Amen. Our hymn is 481, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, hymn 481.
you today. You might remember that during Advent, I was sharing with you um, uh, a book um, by Laura Allery. And she had, and it was a guide to, to Advent and Christmas. She has one that's a guide to Lent and Easter. Um, and so I thought we would, um, as this is the first Sunday in Lent, um, uh, that it would be good in centering us around that. This is the season of Lent. The church is dressed in purple. The, outside, the world outside has its own seasons and its own colors. These days, we are in the gray time between winter and spring. Some mornings, the puddles are frozen hard and the bare branches of trees scrape a snow-white sky. Other days, the air is warmer, ice is melting, and the air smells faintly of damp earth and rotting leaves. Under the ground, seeds and bulbs are sleeping, dreaming in shades of green. We are all waiting for spring. In the church, we are waiting too, waiting for Easter. While we wait, we get ready. Long ago, Jesus went out alone into the desert to get ready. Deep inside, he felt that God had important work for him to do. But he needed help to see clearly the way ahead. For 40 days and 40 nights, he was in the desert by himself, wondering, talking with God, listening, making choices. I wonder why Jesus went into the desert. Maybe it was quiet and still. Maybe Jesus thought he could hear God better there. Maybe he needed to make time to listen so he would know which way to go. Sometimes we think of waiting as passive, boring. Uh, we just want to get it over with and get on with it. But Lent is a time of active waiting. It's not passive. It is intentional as we get ready and prepare our hearts for Easter. I wonder how you will make your Lent a time of active waiting. I wonder what things you will do as you prepare. Our responsive psalm is Psalm 32, and we will be singing refrain two. transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. My body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with that cross of
instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but the steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous. Share for the joy of all you upright in heart. join on the chorus of this anthem. Uh, it's repeated all the way through. Uh, you'll be able to pick it up after you've heard it a couple of times. If you want to, great. If you don't, that's fine too. But you're invited. I know it says in the bulletin, but I thought I'd put it into words. Thank you. 
we continue in scripture with uh, Romans chapter 5 verses 12 to 19. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people, because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as Adam did, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if, the, if many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of the righteousness of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the men were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. From the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended to him. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts together be found holy and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. One of Dr. Zeus's most popular books is a book, is a book called Oh, the Places You'll Go. <laughs> it's a wonderful book, but there's one part of it that merits a bit of exploration and perhaps critique. And that is his description of what he calls a most useless place, the waiting place. For people just waiting, waiting for a train to go, or a bus to come, or a plane to go, or the mail to come, or the rain to go, or the phone to ring, or the snow to snow, or waiting around for a yes or a no, or waiting for their hair to grow. Everyone is just waiting, waiting for the fish to bite 
or waiting for wind to fly a kite, or waiting around for a Friday night, or waiting perhaps for their Uncle Jake, or a pot to boil, or a better break, or a string of pearls, or a pair of pants, or a wig with curls, or another chance. <laughs> Everyone is just waiting. Dr. Zeus describes the type of waiting that gets in the way of living. The type of waiting that leads to being stuck, to being complacent. The type of waiting place where bitterness breeds, where resentment rules, and temptation takes a troubling turn. That's a waiting place that's problematic because it lacks purpose and it is stopped prayerfully and patiently trusting God in the process. There's another type of waiting, though, an important type that is intentional and purposeful. It's called active waiting. Lent is a season of active waiting. Similarly, Jesus' time in the wilderness might be described in that way. Jesus' 40 days and 40 nights is not simply him waiting for his ministry to begin. It is purposeful. Jesus has been baptized. He has had his identity named and claimed by God. And then he is led by the Spirit into the wilderness. There are similar stories about Mo of Moses and Elijah having such experiences in their stories and journeys of faith and ministry. The time in the wilderness is a time of learning to trust God and to come to understand what it means to belong to God, to let that sense of belonging provide sustenance and protection. Matthew's audience is living in a time of intense suffering under the occupation and rule of the Roman Empire. And the early church must choose whether its path will be the way of the empire or whether it will take its model from Jesus and live faithfully. Ronald Allen states, Matthew uses the three temptations as models of points at which the church is tempted to turn away from the movement towards the realm of God and to continue to live in the selfish, violent, self-destructive ways of the age of old. Jesus has been fasting in the desert, and he's pretty hungry at this point. And so when the accuser shows up, he baits him with, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into loaves of bread. But this is not a choice about physical needs versus spiritual ones, between bread for the body and the word of God for the soul. It is about where we turn to for, the, for bread and the other resources needed for survival. It is about turning to God in times of need and trusting that God will provide. In the second temptation, Jesus is taken to the pinnacle of the temple, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down and let God's angels catch you. Jesus throwing himself off the temple would be highly public and visible. And though Jesus does perform miracles, they are not stunts. They are not arbitrary or self-serving. Asking God's angels to pluck a falling Jesus from the air would be an act of public exhibitionism putting God to the test. There's a modern parable that you may have heard of about a man and a storm. A storm warning is given, and the man doesn't leave, saying, God will save me. The rain starts coming, and emergency personnel come around, urging people to evacuate. Still, the man stays put, saying, God will save me. The waters rise. He moves higher and higher. Someone in a motorboat comes by, offering rescue to those who did not make it out before the water made driving conditions impossible. Don't worry, he says, God will save me. 
The waters continue to rise. The man moves up to the roof of his house. A helicopter comes by, but the man refuses it. The storm wages on. The waters continue to rise. The man perishes. He arrives in heaven and says, God, why didn't you save me? And God says, I tried. I sent you a warning. Rescue workers came to your door. I sent a motorboat and a helicopter. You turned them all away. Sometimes we are so focused on the extraordinary that we miss God coming to us in the everyday moments. We miss God coming to us in one another. We miss the common and practical grace that is present in so many moments in our lives. The Roman Empire is very much the background of the third temptation. Resources, wealth, power, and privilege will come to the occupied and oppressed if only they fall down and worship the tempter. This temptation is a choice the Mathean community faced every day. Denying God in favor of the Roman Empire for the power, privilege, wealth, and protection it promised to afford them. Or might. What decisions do we make about our time, our money, and our resources that show we are worshiping something else above God? How might Lent be a time to evaluate and reorient ourselves around that. Throughout these temptations, the accuser is baiting Jesus by trying to throw his identity into question, by trying to use his identity to get under his skin. Jesus refused to take the bait. He kept saying over and over in his actions, my identity has already been named and claimed by God, and nothing can ever take that away. Jesus' wilderness journey is not one of meaningless waiting. It is one of learning to trust God and his identity in God. It is a time of active, purposeful waiting. Lent is not a time for us to just twiddle our thumbs as we wait for Easter. It's purposeful. A pulpit vacancy can feel for a congregation like they are in the waiting place. Particularly because there's so much, there's so little the search committee and inter moderator can say as the process is unfolding. And so it's easy for temptation to creep in, to feel frustrated and angry, to doubt an interim moderator and the search committee. A year ago, I was serving as an interim moderator at a church in Toronto, and we were just entering the second round of interviews. And so I'm aware of the angst that the congregation was feeling and the pressure the search committee was committee also felt. Questions that you may have also been feeling around this same time last year. And questions presenting themselves may have been the same ones you wrestled with as a congregation last year. Questions like, why is this taking so long? Why can't you tell us more? Why can't we just hire someone and be done with it? Waiting can be hard. But it isn't useless. Look at all that has unfolded in the past year. All that we are about to reflect on together in our congregational meeting. When you look back at the church over the past year, what stands out for you? What were the hopes and prayers, fears and feelings from a year ago? And how were those prayers answered? How do we live them out? Live out our way to the answer. How, do you see, how did you see God at work? Ministry in this place did not stop during the vacancy. The proclamation of God's word did not cease. 
You did not stop being the church. And God did not stop loving, caring, or providing for you. God was active in all of the waiting, yours and mine. God was present, teaching us to trust, to listen, to see God's steadfastness. God was with us in and through all of it, preparing the way, preparing us for one another. It is essential for us to remember the importance of active waiting as we look at the year ahead, as we think about the outreach efforts and new initiatives we may embark on together. Outreach requires active waiting. Years of street-level outreach has taught me the importance of this, but I think congregations are often quick to dismiss it. Outreach is a form of active waiting. It requires a patient presence where respect is conveyed through patiently awaiting readiness for change. If we, as street outreach workers, measure the success and effectiveness of our street level outreach by our first night out, we wouldn't have gotten very far. If we had said, ah, oh, nobody wanted to talk to us or take an outreach bag, I guess we're not needed here. And do we really want to walk around downtown Toronto at 1 a.m. in the middle of winter anyways? Let's just not bother doing that again. That would have been awful. There's a lot of relationships that never would have been formed. Help that wouldn't have been given. And joy that we would have missed out on. It took faithfully showing up with heavy outreach backpacks full of water bottles, chocolates, public health supplies, and outreach bags each week in all sorts of weather conditions to witness all the ways God was at work. It took months to get to the point where people who would not even talk to us were telling us, hey, make sure that person gets an outreach bag. They keep asking me for hand sanitizer. A couple of years in, those same people who would walk to the other side of the street as they saw us approaching were saving fabric outreach bags for us to reuse, thinking, this is a small thing I can do, sharing pictures with us of their kids, asking us to look up information for apprenticeship programs so that they could lead the sex trade. Active waiting is a necessary part of an outreach ministry. Yet often in church, we dismiss this. We invite someone to come out to worship or to a fellowship event, and if they decline our offer, we never bother to ask them again. If we have an event and it doesn't go as well as we had hoped for and planned, instead of saying, what did we learn? Or how can we make this better next time around? We say, well, we tried that once, it didn't work, and we aren't going to do it again ever. And when someone new brings it up in 20 years' time, we will remind them of this. <laughs> we need to keep showing up. We need to try and discern, and then try again, and discern again, and try again. Actively waiting is an act of faith and trust. It is letting God be God, yielding to what God is already doing. May these Lenten days be ones of active waiting, learning to trust in God's steadfast love and faithfulness. To God be all the glory. Amen. Amen. God has given us so many gifts in Christ and in creation. We offer our gifts in gratitude for the possibilities we enjoy, trusting God to multiply what we bring for goodness.
Lord God, we offer our gifts in thanksgiving for all the goodness you provide. Bless our gifts and our lives so that we become a source of goodness for others. In the name of Christ, our strength and our hope. Amen. forgiveness, him to owe. change, God of waiting, God of wandering, God of the wilderness. Thank you for the example of Jesus, who traveled lightly, who trusted in you. We turn, we in trust turn to you with the concerns on our hearts, the temptations that trouble us, and the struggles in our world. We offer thanks for the efforts of our community at the coldest night of the year walk. We offer our prayers of concern for the housing crisis in our community and across our country, where housing is unaffordable, unavailable, or unsafe. We pray for the homeless and the underhoused. We are reminded this week that it has been one year since the beginning of the war in Ukraine. Conflict and violence continue to wage on there and in so many other places in our world between Israel and Palestine. Help us to not become numb to the needs of others. May we continue to work and pray for peace. We pray also for service and relief efforts underway in Syria and Turkey following the earthquake, in Brazil amidst the floods and landslides, and throughout the world in places where lives are at risk and where there are efforts to rebuild 
after devastating and traumatic events. We pray too for our church family, for those who are facing grief, thinking particularly of the Wright and Scott families, for those undergoing health challenges, for those journeying whose presence we miss and whose safety we trust to you. May we rediscover what Jesus practiced, to travel lightly, to walk with friends, and to trust in you. We pray now as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Our hymn is hymn 479, The Church's One Foundation, and we will be singing verses 1, 2, and 5. That's hymn 479.
So Peter is going to come up here and take a photo for us. Okay, I think that's everything. <laughs> that. May the God of Sarah, Rahab, and Deborah bless you with faith, courage, and wisdom. May Jesus Christ, who is held in Mary's arms, hold you in his loving embrace. And may the Holy Spirit, who comes sailing on the wind, fill all your days with hope. Amen. Amen. Amen.